Houston Sports Station, WEEI. Back here on Radio Row. This is the one week a year where we have our regular weekly visit with Peter King of the MMQB, but we actually get to do it in person. Although today was probably an iffy proposition since he went out ice fishing all day. <laughs> what was oh, it like? my God. <laughs> Crazy. It was unbelievable. What are you thinking? <laughs> Who'd you I, go with? I, Tom West, the PR guy of the Vikings. Yeah. He lives out here. He's a lifelong uh, Minnesotan. And I said, you know, I've always wanted to go ice fishing. It's so strange and so different. And he said, I'll take you. So we went out this morning, and I just got back about a half hour ago, and I'm, it was bone-chilling cold when it just fl- like w- was it cold like the entire time or did it just no we were in a little in? we it, they okay so that a lot of these touch? places have little houses out yeah. there on the on the frozen lake right. and it's really cool they have permanent homes for the for the winter and they're little they look they're they're either huts or like nice looking houses but what tom and his buddies have is like a uh, a tent okay and you could put you know you, the tent is snug to the ice and you could put a heater in there. So it's 25, 30 degrees. It wasn't bad in there. But then you go outside <laughs> and, yeah. you know, to drill some more holes, to dr- auger some more holes in the in the ice. If the f- if where you are, the fish aren't biting. So you want to go somewhere Chase else. Chase them across the lake. And, Dude, and then, me. I mean, wow. it, was, it was 10 below wind chill. How long did you stay out there? We were out there three hours. Oh. Three hours. What'd you catch? No. Yeah. What'd you get? I caught one sunfish, <laughs> about eight <laughs> ounces. It fit in the palm <laughs> of my hand. What a payoff. But what was really cool, what was really cool is that, you know, I mean, we, I took the hook out. I hold, held it in the palm of my hand, took the hook out, and put it back in. And I say, hey, little fella, have a good life. That's right. And it was fun. It was just really cool. It was just those are ki- the kind of experiences. Will I ever go ice fishing again? I hope not. No. Uh, yeah. No, I probably won't. But it was just fun. It was a good time. This has been such a strange uh, setup for us, for this whole Radio Row yeah. thing. And I, and I was telling Peter, I was walking over here uh, by Shake Shack earlier today. And Stephen Guskowski and Joe Cardona and Ryan Allen are all walking along beside me. Nobody knows who they are. Yeah. They don't have, I mean, I don't think you'll see Brady or Gronk wandering through here. But all the running backs were over here at Shake Shack yesterday. They really like it here. Yeah. And I saw Stacey James earlier today, the PR guy for the Patriots. And he said, this is great. It's so incredibly convenient. You just get out of bed, and there's the press conference. There's a bunch of good places to eat. I'm I'm shocked, honestly, Dale, because in my mind, I thought, I, and I have no idea what Bill Belichick thinks, but I thought they would absolutely hate it because come Thursday or Friday, it's going to be mayhem here, you know, because it's the Mall of America number one. So I assume on the weekend and the and and Super Bowl weekend. When the Super Bowl is in your town, all the people who want to come, hey, Mabel, let's go see Radio Row or whatever. It's going to be kind of crazy. You know, speaking of they didn't know who they were, I'll give you a shocking one for that. Last Friday, I rode to work with Doug Peterson, the coach of the Eagles, from his home uh, in South Jersey, actually from a Wawa in South Jersey, <laughs> of course, he met me there, and we drove to work. And the amazing thing was, he got out of car, out of the car, took his debit card out, gave it to a guy, because in New Jersey, you can't just uh, you, you you can't go pump your own gas. You got to have an attendant do it. And he said hello to the guy, said a few things, and they were going back and forth. Guy had, and the guy took his credit card and, and he his and he did name it. on it. He and he had he had no idea <laughs> this, this is the coach of the Super Bowl <laughs> Eagles right with him. And I said, my God, that's cra- that's the craziest thing I've ever seen. Right. So have you nice. have you uh, have you booked your trips to uh, wherever Tom Brady is going to be after the oh. Super Bowl? You're going to set something up like I that don't again? Know. I don't know. I don't. You know, I have. I don't have any happen? idea. Well. We'll see what happens. I mean, I always try to get a really key person from the Super Bowl yeah. and try to do something with them the next week. And luckily, the last few years, I've been able to do it. But I I would almost feel bad if Brady had another ridiculous game of saying, can I come to Montana again? You know, <laughs> I, I might. I don't know. But it's it, I, I feel like I'd be kind of taking advantage of it. Plus, now, everybody knows Brady's life with this Tom versus Time thing, right. you know. So what, what do you think about where he is right now? Eighth Super Bowl for, for Tom Brady and uh, still playing at a high level. 
uh, lots of lots of stories around Brady, football yeah. stories. There was a story about Brady yesterday, and uh, that was his his daughter. Uh, I mean, just w- what do you make of where Brady is right now? I don't think on this Tuesday game before the Super Bowl. Uh, quite honestly, I don't think this game. If he loses this game, I don't know anybody who would say, "Well, boy, I'll tell you what, I'm really marking Brady down for that." I mean. He's the greatest quarterback of all time, in my opinion. And if he loses this game 41-7, to I can't see anybody saying, well, that's it, Montana jumps over him now. I mean, he's been to eight Super Bowls in 17 years. He's 40 years old, he's going to win the MVP. He is doing what Michael Jordan tried to do when he came back to basketball and doing it at a much higher consistent level, at least for a year or two. So... I mean, what happens from here on out, I don't know. But the one thing I think he does if if he wins and has a couple more really good years, I think what he does is he sets the bar so high, it's going to be hard for anybody to ever reach it. And But if he loses this game, I, I don't – I mean, as far as what's it do to his legacy, nothing to my, in, in my way of thinking. Episode three of uh, Tom vs. Time came out while you were ice fishing today. Uh, <laughs> How know, is it? It's, it's, it's really good. good. It's yeah. really in, in What's fact, it about? In Montana, Montana too. Oh, really? Yeah, it's, uh, Edelman and Amadola, Edel- a lot oh, of those okay, guys. Yeah, I was going to ask, yeah. And now he was the one who told you, and we played the audio a ton, about p- playing five more years. And we kept going back to that about five more years. And, and Dale has pointed out, watching this time, uh, Tom vs. Time, even if you were somebody that maybe doubted that, it's giving you more reason to think that he will. So combined with what he told you, but also seeing the whole season play out, do you think 45 is, is realistic for this guy? You know, I don't I don't know really, Rich, because I think you have to look at it. You really have to look at it year by year now because I, 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 there's just no guarantees for anything beyond this. I'll tell you the one interesting thing that I saw in that second episode was when he was with Tom House. And he was out on that field, and Tom House said, you know, for guys like Tom, it's not about getting 5% better. It's about getting 1% better. And and I think that is such an admirable, smart trait that you could apply to any profession, okay? Like, if you want to be really good at your job, okay, and you want to keep being really good at your job, after you've done it for a long time, you don't say something silly like, oh, boy, I'm going to be – I'm going to be so much better this year. I, I think that's unrealistic. If you try hard at your job, how can you at age 40 be 5, 8, 10% better? I think it's st- – but I think you could possibly be 1% better, both in terms of intelligence and what you see on the field. But I know that – you know, and again, I was very interested in what evidently uh, uh, Greg Bishop of SI wrote this, what what – uh, Jay Feely told um, uh, Greg Bishop about oh, Giselle, Giselle yeah. saying, uh, can you please help me convince my husband to stop playing football or whatever, the mm-hmm. some paraphrase mm-hmm. of that. And Feely said, man, you're on your own <laughs> or whatever. And I just think, you know, there's very few things in life that Tom Brady, other than his family, and you know, that he really likes other than football. And so... I think his whole feeling is, as long as I can be protected and as long as I feel pretty good, why not do it? So my gut feeling is, I think 45 is realistic, but I don't think it's something you could sit here today and say, yep, he's playing in 2021. I think it's, it's something he wants to do, but I have no idea if he can do it or not. The brain drain from the Patriots continues. They'll lose both their coordinators this year. There's the possibility, at least, Joe Judge's contract is up. He may be going with Josh to Indianapolis. Uh, there's the real possibility that three of your coaches are going to depart and, and go somewhere else. Is there a tilt point in which Bill Belichick can't keep overcoming this? You know, there could be, but no matter what has happened over the year with the Patriots, over the years with the Patriots, all the people they lose, if they have two people, I'll, I'll, I'll just I'll take my chances with Bill Belichick and Tom Brady taking over the expansion team in Omaha next year, <laughs> and they're going to make the playoffs with getting the last 52 guys on the roster sometime between now and training camp. And so 
the brain drain is significant, but I also think part of that would be energizing for Bill. You know, Bill, his whole life has dealt with, you know, changes and at all stops on the coaching trail. He's dealt with changes. And I think this would be kind of fun to say, hey, you know what our, our challenge is this coming year? We have to invent an offensive coordinator, a defensive coordinator, and a special teams coach. So I, th I just, this is just my thing. I think Bill would not love that, but I think he'll like that. And I think that will really be a fun thing for him this offseason to get going and to see if he can do it. He knows he can do it. He's done it before. And I think, I, I mean, I don't want to be naive. I think they'll be fine. Tell me what you're most looking forward to in the two Bills. You know Bill Parcells very well. You covered him when you yeah. were at Newsday. Uh, Bill Belichick, uh, defensive coordinator there. What are you most looking forward to seeing in this uh, documentary? Well, uh, I saw Scott Pioli recently, and he had been interviewed for this. And he said, you know, the most amazing part of this is, and I'm paraphrasing, is when both these guys were asked in the presence of the other one, uh, you know, Bill Belichick, do you love Bill Parcells? And Bill, do you love Bill Belichick? Something like that. It, I'm, I might be wrong, but, but Scott said that that was really a pretty emotional thing. And I'm not used to either one of these guys being very emotional. The one thing, when Parcells went to Wellington Mara's funeral, you know, whatever, a decade ago now or whatever it was, when he went to uh, Wellington Mara's funeral, I think the issue of his own mortality really hit home. And I have noticed in the last few years when I call Bill Parcells, he is, he is significantly more, uh, he's significantly more, hey, let's talk and let's, let, you know, because it's not that he has nothing to do. I don't mean that, but, you know, I think he's more interested. I don't even mean in rekindling the old days, but I think he's more interested in basically, you know, uh, kind of being a mensch mm. when I don't know that he ever cared about that stuff in his life. And I think Bill Parcells, and I don't, I can't say it about Bill Belichick because I really don't know him anymore, but Bill Parcells, really has changed i think as a person and that's one of the reasons why i'm really looking forward to this because i think he'll be a softer more touchy feely bill parcells i, I don't know that but that, it, that's my gut feeling what jumps out to you about this eagles team and you know what what kind of challenge do they present on sunday i think the eagles are really really good and they could win this game definitely i'm not just saying that i think when you look at the minnesota game i thought that you know, I thought Philadelphia was a legitimate slight underdog in that game. But what we saw in that game is that, you know, everybody always says, okay, you give Belichick, McDaniels, uh, Patricia two weeks, you give them the extra week, nobody's beating them. They're, they're fantastic, which they are. But this Philadelphia team, especially offensively to diagnose, is going to be very, very hard. And I'll give you my, like, my pet stat in this, okay? So in the Atlanta playoff game, all right, the average pass by Nick Foles was thrown 5.1 yards past the line of scrimmage. So in other words, that's the classic dink and dunk game. Nick Foles threw the ball horizontally all game against the Atlanta Falcons. Against Minnesota... The average pass traveled 10.7 yards beyond the line of scrimmage. And he completed his two bombs in that game. 53 and 41 yards right on target. So now, if you're Bill Belichick and Matt Patricia particularly, you're looking at that tape and you're saying, hey, you know, if this were a different game, you know, I would have, we would have said we're taking um, – Ertz out of the game or we're taking some intermediate weapon out of the game I don't think you can do that now with the Philadelphia Eagles because they can play a lot of different ways so I think the Patriots really have to respect all aspects of the Philadelphia offense and that's what I think is going to be different about this game when you guys meet on Saturday 
I think Randy Moss will be elected to the Football Hall of Fame. Will Ty Law? Dale, uh, I've said this fairly consistently during the course of this week. I am terrible at predicting the Pro Football <laughs> Hall of Fame. And uh, year after year, every year when I go in, I'll write down, uh, okay, 15 modern era candidates. I'll write down my five who I think are going to get in. I forget what year this was. It was the year that Aeneas Williams got in. I, I miss four out of five. And I usually miss at least two, at least. And if I had to guess this year, Ty Law is going to be is going to be one of the toughest calls because, in my opinion, I think you have Ray Lewis, who stands above all, okay? Number two, at least in my opinion, is going to be Randy Moss. But I don't even think he's automatic because wow. there are going to be a lot of people who are going to say, I, 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 like, I like Owens. And, and we have got to rectify the problem of Owens. That isn't to say that two receivers can't get in. But I, this is just my perspective, okay? We have a guy in the Hall of Fame committee named Rick Gosselin from Dallas. He is what I call the conscience of the Pro Football Hall of Fame. He's never emotional in the room. He simply states facts. And Rick Gosselin, I'm just predicting, because he says this, he writes this all the time, and he says this when I'm together with him. We're going to the uh, wild uh, Vegas hockey game Friday night because whenever I can, I always like to go over everything with the Hall of Fame. We maybe go to dinner or whatever, but a lot of times on Friday night I'm with him. And I will guarantee you, I mean, everybody in that room looks at Rick Gosselin and has tremendous respect for him. And he's going to talk about we have a tremendous problem in this committee with putting defensive guys in the Hall of Fame. We need to continue to chip away at the defensive, uh, you know, inequity in the Hall of Fame. Do you realize that, you know, among all Hall of Fame members, all Hall of Fame uh, members, that 56% of the Pro Football Hall of Fame is offensive players. 28% of the Pro Football Hall of Fame is defense. And the rest are, you know, coaches, contributors, contributors yeah, yeah. all that stuff. So, Dale, it's two times as many, you know, offensive players as defensive. And I have tremendous – I look, this is on my watch. I've done it 25 years. This is my fault. This is all of our responsibility to get that better. So if you're asking me, if it's if it's close, I mean, if it, or if it's even, I'm probably going to be more inclined to go with the defensive guy. And so that would I've got one other little thing about the Hall of Fame this year. And so I like Ty Law's candidacy. I like Brian Dawkins' candidacy a lot. I wish that there could be a spot for Everson Walls, and maybe there will be. He's the only cornerback to lead the NFL in interceptions three years in a row. And, you know, he had a good postseason career and everything. But here's the one one other person in the hall this year. It's Tony Baselli. And so everybody would say, yeah, yeah, really good player. Well, here's the thing about Baselli. Last year, you know, Terrell Davis gets in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. He had three intergalactic years and one very good year. Okay? Ken Easley gets in the Hall of Fame. He had probably five incredible years and two very good years. Okay? Here comes Tony Baselli. In my opinion, he played six solid, he played six full years. Okay? And then he played a little bit more, but his shoulders were bad. So, to me, Tony Baselli was as good a left tackle as Terrell Davis was a running back. Now, Terrell Davis has the incredible postseason success, and that is a big factor. But I'm just saying, Terrell Davis had four years, and and again, I'm not I'm not saying I'm not throwing brick bats at him, but <laughs> I am saying what I am saying is that is that I do think that Tony Baselli, if you're the best left tackle of your day, and I believe he was, uh, that's a crucial position on the field, and I definitely think he belongs. So he's another little X factor on Saturday. We always appreciate the time. It's fun to talk football with you and ice fishing. All right. right. It's a combo we stuff. almost Thank you. It's a busy week for you. You're too. a main guy. Have you never been oh, ice no, fishing? Been. Oh, no, yeah? I've been. 
Lots yeah. of times. Oh, yeah. oh yeah, look at that. You just got <laughs> yeah. that. You got that low. I'm going to say yeah. that for the end. Oh, I've been out there, Peter. <laughs> I, I try on. to go when it's a little warmer than it is out there, though. Yeah. I mean, it's a yeah. little chilly out there. But the yeah. ice is thick. You're, you're perfectly safe. Peter, yeah. good to see you. Thanks a lot, guys. Peter, right, Peter King from the MMQB joining us here on Sports Radio, WEEI.